walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for this reading of your holy, inspired word, infallible, inerrant, guide to us, revelation from you to help us know how to be in a relationship with you and then how those who are part of the family of God live. Thank you. Thank you this morning for the testimony of Doug and uh, of uh, Matt and uh, Amy. And uh, we pray that you'll bless their lives as they go to this difficult place to minister your word. We pray that they will see fruit from their labor as they labor among those who really, Lord, in some ways exhibit some of the most broken uh, characteristics of a fallen race. Will you give them encouragement? Will you provide for their needs both physically and emotionally and spiritually? Thank you that they uh, could come and be with us today. We pray, Father, for our own individual lives, that you will speak to us the words that we need whether it's encouragement, whether it's conviction, whatever it is, comfort, Lord, that we would receive from you as we open our eyes and ears to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Had an email message, or actually a, you know, a, one of these internet messages pop up not, not, not long ago that read something like this. It said, for sale... Genuine imitations of luxury watches. I thought for a moment I was back in Hong Kong where almost on every street corner somebody's trying to sell you a genuine imitation Rolex. If you want to know how to tell the difference between the imitation and the real, see me afterwards if you don't already know. But genuine imitations. The problem with the genuine imitation is it's still a fake, right? still fake. And I think it's interesting as we come now, as we're approaching that time when Jesus is about to give his life, he has now been through this marvelous 20th chapter of Luke, bested all of his, the, the people that have come at him, the enemies that have been on top of him all of this time, everyone, they could not, they could not get the better of him, they could not discredit him. And now, as one of the last statements that he makes, not the last, but close to, he is anxious to tell his disciples, of all the things that are going on in this world, you must be the real thing. You cannot settle for being genuine imitations. He is, he is issuing a warning about the insidiousness of hypocrisy. It's a familiar theme. It's one that he has addressed before. But now he's addressing it to his own disciples. So by extension, this is for all of us. I see three parts in this passage that we want to look at today. First of all, there's the caution against hypocrisy. The caution. Verse 45. In the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes. Now, if you were to turn to Matthew 23, you would see a whole separate message that he preached to the scribes and Pharisees at this point, of which this is a very brief summary. It is a hard message, perhaps the hardest one that Jesus ever preached. But here we have a summary of it, which is enough to tell us that he does not want us to be like those. Now, this is interesting because who are the scribes? You will recall, if you've been with us, that the scribes are the well-educated Pharisees. They're the ones who are most in tune with the law of God, but particularly with the tra traditions, the oral traditions which had grown up around the law of God, which basically rendered it ineffective. They are the rabbi class, the most respected people in Jewish society. 
As one commentator put it, the scribes were the dominant force in Judaism, not only theologically, but socially. And yet Jesus says, beware. Beware of the scribes. I guarantee you that was a shocker. Although the crowd is listening in, Jesus is addressing his disciples. Know how this, notice how the scripture makes a special point of that. Why? Because within weeks, these uneducated, backward Galileans will become the dominant force among the Jews of believers. And unlike the scribes, it is critical that they be real, that they be genuine. The scribes were a deadly toxin in their society, though they were well respected and looked up to, which made it all the worse. They were not real. Their teaching was laced with strychnine. Beware of the scribes. It would be kind of like saying today to us, beware of Billy Graham, or beware of, you know, Kevin DeYoung, or Rick Warren, or whatever person you look up to theologically. That's how challenging this would have sounded to the men that Jesus is addressing here. Of course, the men I just mentioned are real, true men of God. But the scribes, even though they looked like men of God and were revered as men of God, were not real. Genuine imitations. That's all they were. You know, the Lord is warned in many ways. Just like, just because it looks like a sheep and baths like a sheep doesn't mean it's a sheep, right? Could be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, as Jesus warns in Matthew 17, 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And let me tell you, beloved, false prophets were not unique just to the first century. They weren't limited just to that time and to that space. We have to realize, I meet so many people who think because they see someone on television or someone in a, in a, in a concert or somewhere on a stage who mentions the name of God or says the name of Jesus or quotes a passage of Scripture that they are to be believed. We must be more discerning than that. How can you tell? Deuteronomy 13 and 18 give us very specific instructions about how to tell a false prophet from a true prophet. There are many people around today claiming to be prophets. But the Bible says this, and it gives four things, and I'm just going to summarize, and we're not going to look there, but I'm going to summarize these for you. The first thing is that they will issue a message that points toward God, not toward idols. So the first thing you want to look for, anybody that you're hearing, what is the core of their message? Is it how to get more money? Is it how to live a more successful life? Is it how to make your dreams come true? Is it how to have health and wealth? Because that's not where God goes. That's not the message of the gospel. And if that's at the core of what someone is teaching, they're a false prophet. A second thing that distinguishes a false prophet is that his message is not true to God's Word. He may be very true to some select portion of God's Word. That's what makes them false prophets. That's what, that's what makes them wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. They look like the real thing. They quote the same things that you hear other places. But is, it, is the way they're interpreting it true to the rest of Scripture? So the better you can know Scripture, the better you can see. Thirdly, and this is a good one. God says, if I send a prophet to you and he prophesies something, you can be sure it's going to happen. A hundred percent of the time. Now this is where I really get confused because we have many prophets today claiming to be people, claiming to be prophets, looked up to as prophets, 
And I don't know of a single one who claims 100% accuracy. I heard one just the other day who said that his accuracy rate and that of the people that he knew that claimed to be prophets is on average about 65%. So my first question is, well, what, which one-third of what you're telling me is a lie, right? Which one-third isn't true? God says, if I send a prophet to you, and he's a true prophet of God, what he tells you will be true 100% of the time. That's how you'll know. Finally, God says they will live a godly lifestyle, not extravagant, not greedy, not immoral, not amoral. So many of the so-called prophets have been caught up. I could list for you scandal after scandal that these prophets have been caught up in. So do we have false prophets today, of course? Well, but just because someone has the title, you know, reverend, pastor, doctor, apostle, prophet, bishop, doesn't mean that they are real. You must be discerning and you must look to see that someone is really real. They may look very good. They may even give you some, some potentially some kind of help, but dig deep. Are they real? Get the details. Check them out against Scripture. Check their lifestyle. Matthew 7 says, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Don't just take what they say. Beware. You know, there'd be no need to beware if they didn't look good, would there? They didn't look right. You wouldn't have to beware. You would automatically throw them aside. So beware, Jesus says. One famous so-called prophet said this to a huge following not long ago, God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. Adam was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. He was God. Really? Later he says, you don't have to a God in you, you are one. I guarantee you one thing, that's news to God. That's news to God. You're in the image of God, beloved, and you're valuable because of that. And the people that, 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 that um, I, I keep wanting to call you Doug. I don't know why, Matt. I'm really sorry. But the people that Matt and Amy, I'm going to re, rename you. Uh, people that Matt, Matt and Amy are going to minister to are in the image of God, just like we are. Broken just like we are. In need of redemption just like we are. It's heresy to say that we have somehow become a God. I have a file full of so-called so preachers who deny the inerrancy of Scripture, who deny the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, who deny that we need to be saved, who deny these days in particular the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only way? False prophets? Be a Berean. Be a Berean. What did the Bereans do? Remember Paul went to Thessalonica and then he went down to Berea. And he says this in Acts 17, 11. It says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They had the Apostle Paul himself as their pastor, and what were they doing? Checking him out, according to the Word of God. And so should you be, and so should we all be. You hear a sermon from this pulpit, you ought to be going home and check it out. And if you think it's not right, you ought to be coming back and saying, I think you missed this thing. Check it out. Spurgeon said this, he said, discernment is not only a matter of discerning truth from falsehood, but also a matter of discerning truth from half-truth. That's true. Discernment is not only a matter of discerning truth from falsehood, but also a matter of discerning truth from half-truth. Check things out, beloved. There's a lot of genuine imitations 
around. So that's the caution. But now Jesus goes on to a second point, and he gives us some of the characteristics. Now, this is not a full list by any means. This is representative. But here are some of the characteristics of hypocrisy. And remember, remember, Jesus is addressing this to his disciples. He's saying to his disciples, this is what the Pharisees are like. This is what you must not be like. So this is for us. So what are they? Five of them that he lists here. First of all, appearance. Appearance. The scribes like to walk around in long robes. Like to walk around in so, long Okay, so anything wrong with long robes? No. Anything wrong with liking long robes too much? Yes. This is undoubtedly a reference to two things. The Pharisees made a big show of complying with what the Bible said in Numbers 15, verses 38 to 40, where it talked about you needed to wear tassels on your robes in order to indicate your compliance or uh, as a reminder of the commandments of God. Wear these tassels. So the Pharisees took this to a ridiculous extreme. They had huge tassels on their robes indicating and on an ostentatious display of their compliance with the commandments, when that, what they were really complying with was their ungodly, worldly interpretation of what God had said. The second thing they did was they wore these long white linen robes in order to stand out from the rest of the crowd to indicate their purity. Their name, Pharisees, meant separated ones, and they took that very literally. They were the power dressers of the first century. Look out for long robes. This is kind of an aside, but one of the reasons preaching in robes has never appealed to me is this passage of Scripture. Take it literally. It doesn't mean that somebody who preaches in a robe is wrong. If he's teaching the Bible, he's perfectly fine. But, beloved, be careful. I'm no different than you, and neither is anybody who's preaching the Word of God. They're just called to a particular vocation. But you know what I would also note for us by way of application? It's just not the religious people or people in religious leadership that we need to be thinking about when it comes to dress, when it comes to appearance. Is there anything wrong with taking pride in our appearance? No, there's not. We should look as good as we can, I think. I don't think there's any virtue in looking like a, like a slob. But, but, beloved, we have to be careful. We're not dressing to attract attention to ourselves. Parents, you must teach this to your children. The world is not going to teach them that. The world's going to teach them to dress, to value themselves based on how much attention they can attract. I promise you that's what the world is teaching them. If they're going to learn that what's really required by God is an appearance that is acceptable to him, not to the rest of the world. They'll learn it from you. They're not going to learn it somewhere else. God's approval is what matters. And that's what we need to be teaching our children, not how to get attention by who can dress the most immodestly. 2009, beautiful young woman named Kylie, Kylie Basuti beat out 10,000 other models to realize her dream of becoming a Victoria's Secret model. I hope you can get that dream out of the mind of your daughters, but she had that dream, and she became a Victoria's Secret model, something she had dreamed of since the age of 14. But as a new believer, she began to feel the immodesty of her modeling and the inconsistency of that with her faith. In 2011, she got married. By February 2012, she left her very lucrative career as a Victoria's Secret model. She was interviewed. It's a big, it's a big newsworthy event for some reason. She was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos, ABC News said, why would you give up this career? 
She said, I wanted, I came to the place I realized I wanted to honor God and my husband with my body and not conform to society's rules. She said, I saw other young ladies, including my own sister, coming and saying to me that they wanted to be like me and that they were going to go on these huge diets and all this other stuff that they thought it took to get to be what I was. She wanted to be a better role model. Stephanopoulos, of course, asked him, did your husband make you do this? She said, no, my husband said it was my decision what I wanted to do, but she did say he was very, very thankful. Then she was asked, will you still model? She said, yes, but I just want to be more wholesome about it. The jobs that I choose are always going to honor the Lord. That's what we need to teach our kids. That's what we need to teach. I mean, it's easy to pick on the girls, but the guys are, you know, they have their own rules as well, right? To bring attention to self. Well, how are we dressing? What is the message of our appearance? It's to be to bring glory to God, beloved, not to ourselves. You know, if we're spending too many hours in front of the mirror, I had a friend, I, I, I hope he didn't really mean it, but he'd say, I, you know, I can hardly wait till tomorrow morning because I get better looking every day. I, I don't know if he really meant that or not, but we don't. We, we, you know, the, the idea is whatever God has given us, that's what we work with. But we dress to please him, not to please what society tells us is right. Dress for God, not for you, and you won't have the problem that the scribes had. So appearance, number one. Number two, sign of hypocrisy, a claim. The scribes loved greetings in the marketplaces. Now, that doesn't mean that they just love to go up and down saying, hello, how are you doing today? I mean, that's not what this was about. They love for people to come up to them and recognize them. They love for people to come up and say, good morning, rabbi. Good morning, doctor. How are you? They loved that. They loved the acclaim. Easy trap to fall into, isn't it? We love titles. Love to see our name in print. We love a claim. <clears throat> we hate it when somebody else gets recognized and we don't. Which, by the way, I mean, the minute, you, the minute that pops up in your mind, you need to remind yourself, if that's how you're thinking, you probably didn't do it for the right reason in the first place, right? If you're worried that somebody else got a claim and you didn't, you may be right, you deserved it as much as they do, but you're wrong in that you were probably doing it for the acclaim rather than for the Lord. They love to claim. They love titles. I remember my brother John got a doctorate. Some of you have met him. If you sat down and talked to him, he got that, I don't know, probably 20 years ago now, but if you sat down and talked to him, you'd never know that he had that kind of degree. He just, he just, he is who he is. I, I love, we have a number of people in our own congregation who are doctors. I don't know of a single one that presses that point. I love that. I know of others who got that doctorate and couldn't wait to get it on their email and social media and where else they could put it, right? Couldn't get it there fast enough. Maybe their heart is right. I don't know. I can't judge that. But I know that the outward appearance is that maybe they're a little too looking for the acclaim that comes with that. I'm not saying don't go get a doctorate. Go get it. But beloved, make sure it's for the right reasons. We're not looking for, we're not here to get acclaim. We're here to bring glory to God. The more we know God, the more we want to see him glorified. We'll be like John the Baptist who could say of Jesus, you know, he must increase but I must decrease. Most of us are kind of looking to increase. A claim, sign of hypocrisy. How about a third one? Ambition. Ambition. The scribes, in verse 46, love the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor and feasts. Position meant everything to them. In the synagogues, they wanted to be on the platform. Depending on how, how the synagogue organization went, 
It might be a different place, but today we would say they want to be right up front. They want to be on the platform, or at least on the first. They want to be seen. It's all about seeing and being seen with the scribes. And at feasts, they wanted to have that place of honor next to the host. Remember how at feasts they had these tables where you kind of laid around the table rather than sat, but everybody was oriented based on ranking, and they wanted to be the one sitting next to the host. They would fight over that. Human heart always wants to be first, right? It's an easy disease to contract and hard to expel. It's who we are naturally. And so you have to work at it or allow the Lord to work at it in your life to get rid of it. It doesn't come naturally. I've, I've watched people fight like cats and dogs over getting another couple square feet in their office as opposed to somebody else, or to get an office that's, you know, one step closer to the president or the CEO of the company, all about position, driven by ambition, we want to throw our weight around because of what we've done or where we've been or you know, the, the titles we've had or the jobs we've had. This is so easy to fall into such a trap. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you recognize it in yourself. I recognize it all over me constantly. One of my, one of my biggest prayers for my own self, and you can help me with it, is to, is, you know, it's hard to believe you can be proud when you don't have anything to be proud of, right? But we do. Don't want to be proud looking for position, looking for acclaim. We're like the celebrity. We'll end up like the celebrity. He went to do a benefit, you know, at a home for seniors, and he got up and he said, do you know who I am? Some old crusty old guy at the side said no, but he said, if you check with the front desk, they'll be able to tell you. <laughs> they'll inform you. You know what the front desk is for Christians? The front desk for Christians is Colossians 3, verse 3. Remember it? We memorized it. You have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Is your life hidden with Christ in God? And is that the way you live? Or is it for the acclaim that you can get? Or are you looking for the glory that you can pass on to him? That's where we're to be as a child of the... You know, our, our glory is not in what we can do and, and in how big we can make ourselves. Our glory is in the fact that we belong to him, that we're part of the family of God, and that we can bring glory and honor to him. That's the acclaim we're looking for. We have, at the end of the day, an audience of one. And so often we're too busy playing to the audience of many that doesn't matter. So, characteristics of hypocrisy, appearance, acclaim, ambition. Here's the fourth one, affluence. Affluence. The scribes in verse 47 devour widows' houses. That's an owner's charge. It's an owner's charge. Widows were the weakest members of society in a time when there was no, uh, no, no kind of social structure to catch them up. To become a widow without money was to become a beggar, usually. They were to be protected for and cared for by God's people. It's all over the Old Testament. Exodus 22, verse 22, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Isaiah 117, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause, and in many other places, it's all over the Old Testament. This was the instruction of God to his people, but it was not happening in Israel. I think it's a challenge for us, too. I think we, we have good intentions, but you know, I'm, I think even in our own church, we don't have a very good organization for taking care of those who are weaker. We usually find out about the problem after it's already been solved instead of before when we might be able to help. We need help in that area. We need God to call someone out, some group of people, praying we can improve on that. The problem for these guys went even deeper than that. They weren't just ignoring the problem. They were busy creating the problem. They were creating the problem. 
They were doing it for money. Why else would you devour a widow's house? They were cruel in the extreme. The Greek word devour means to eat, thus to consume and to use up. And these guys were preying on widows. Jesus doesn't spell out here exactly how this was happening, but we can surmise some of the ways that it was happening. We know for sure that they were telling their parents, and we assume that was mother and father, but when dad's gone, just mother, sorry, any money I might have given you is Corbin, meaning I gave it to the church. Their excuse was because they wanted to make a show of the giving. They gave money that should have rightfully gone to their parents. They were giving it to the church. They were devouring widows' houses, including their own mother's. Some of them were the financial advisors of their day, and so they set up they set up services, as we have today, to invest money at an exploitive commission so that whether the, whether the things they invested made any money or not, they were making money, eating up the widow's resources when they were consumed by bad investment policies. Others were even more despicable and, I think, very modern in what they did. Rabbis were legally bound to teach for free. They were to support themselves, and their teaching was to be for free. But gifts were acceptable. Gifts were acceptable. And these guys knew fundraising. See, They taught that there was no greater act of piety than to support a rabbi with a gift. I picked out just one of many statements that I found on this. One of the rabbis said, whoever puts part of his income into the purse of the wise, meaning the scribes, is counted worthy of a seat in the heavenly academy. Well, who wouldn't want to go to heaven? So they were doing, they were making unscrupulous appeals to impressionable women who had been left alone, and they were making them only to feather their own nest. They cared little for how it affected their victims. Doesn't that remind you of what goes on in our day? Just an ancient, just an ancient implementation of the appeals of money-grubbing shysters urging people to give money they don't have to get some promised healing or some promised blessing that never comes. And who would be more vulnerable to this than good-hearted, well-intentioned, Widows who no longer have someone else to consult with on these kind of decisions. Such illicit appeals in God's name, beloved, are treacherous, and I hope that you will never be victimized by them. The creative, creativity of these, of these scams is endless. I mean, there's a, new, there's a new one every day. When I heard recently a, a, a woman got a letter in the mail from a, from, a, from a Christian leader whose name, if I said it, you would know. And the, and the, and the letter said, I saw, your, I saw your face in a vision. And then it went on to tell about all the good things he was doing, and of course at the end it was an appeal for money. I saw your face in a vision. She wasn't aware that this letter went out thousands of times, put out, of course, by the organization's computer, who I guess had seen all these visions. Believing the letter was inspired by God, she sent in money, never bothering to ask how the guy managed to come up with her name and address just from the face that he saw in the vision. The desire for affluence, beloved. If, you, you know, if, you're, if you're following someone and you know, two-thirds of the time is spent with the appeal for money, go find somebody else to follow. God supplies what we need. Affluence. How about a fifth one? Affectation. Affectation. What, is, what in the world is that? That's trying to look good. Trying to look good. How did, the, how did these guys do it? They offered long theological prayers. Anything wrong with long prayers? No. But the scribes notice it for a pretense. For a pretense, 
make long prayers. It wasn't real. It was genuine imitation. It was like the guy in Luke 18 who itemized all of his goodness, right? Thanking God that God had made him like this. Remember that? And God said, no, I'll tell you who went home justified. It was the poor tax collector who came in and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The sinner, literally. Affectation. You know, any prayer is a good prayer if it comes from the heart, right? I love, frankly, simple, short prayers. I mean, I love great, long theological prayers if it feels like they're really coming from the heart as well. Short, simple, from the heart. We're not putting on an act. You know, we, we, ha we learn the jargon. We kind of get the spiritual, you know, order of the day down. This is how you talk. Some of us really, we, we have a switch, a vocabulary switch. We turn it one way for church, we turn it the other way when we leave. That's what Jesus is getting at here. You cannot do that. You're just nothing but a genuine imitation. If you want to know if this is true of you, just ask yourself if you would talk the same way in front of your unsaved friends that you do at church, and vice versa. Right? Affecting something that's not real. There's an old story about D.L. Moody. You know, he, he, he had an organizer who was, uh, had introduced him, and then he was getting up and he was offering a prayer before Moody was going to preach, but he, he just couldn't get stopped, you know. Fifteen minutes into the prayer, Moody got up and he put his arm around a guy and he said to the crowd, turn to page 45, we're going to finish singing while this guy finishes his prayer. Pretty bold move, right? But he recognized the insincerity, the affectation of this. And we can be just as guilty, showing ourselves off by the way we talk, by the spiritual jargon that we're able to throw around. I don't want to discourage you from talking. I just want to make sure that what we say and the things we do and the way we are with each other is the same that we are with the rest of the world. We cannot and we dare not be genuine imitations. We're the ones that are showing off the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll notice, he talked the same way to the unbelievers that he did to the believers, didn't he? It wasn't one thing on Sunday and something else the rest of the week. So these are five characteristics of hypocrisy. If you notice, the one thing that's common to all of them is calling attention to self calling attention to self. That's how you know that hypocrisy is getting a hold. And listen, I, I will be the first to acknowledge, I think we all have elements of hypocrisy in us. But that's one of the reasons we come together, so that we can stimulate each other, according to Hebrews 10, to love and good works, to, to, to get rid of those things in our life that do not reflect glory to him, that reflect glory to us. How we must do that. So those are the characteristics. One more point here, the condemnation. Condemnation, verse 47b. They will receive the greater condemnation. You know, representing God to others, beloved, is the greatest privilege that we have as a Christian, isn't it? It really is. It's the only thing that has eternal value is to represent God to others, but it demands great humility. Now, Jesus is clear here that a hip hypocritical lifestyle on the part of a leader will lead to greater judgment. It's the same thing James says in James 3, verse 1, when he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I mean, this just simply affirms what the Bible teaches in other places, that there are degrees of punishment in hell and there are levels of reward in heaven, meaning that how we live now has eternal consequences. Has eternal consequences. So we need to be real. Mahatma Gandhi, the great Indian nonviolence leader, was deeply interested in Christianity early in his life. He read the Gospels through a number of times, and he finally decided, he decided one Sunday he was going to go to church, 
and his intention was to talk to the pastor of the church about the gospel, about what it meant to come to faith, to believe in Jesus, which he had read over and over in the gospels. But he got to church that morning, British church, because the Britons were ruling in India at the time, and the usher who met him at the door suggested that he would not seat him. In fact, he said, you should probably go worship with your own people. So Mahatma Gandhi left, never to return. Here's what he said. He said, if Christians have a caste system also, I might as well remain a Hindu. Can't, you can't beat the logic, can you? If we're just like the rest of the world, why would they want to be us? Why would they want to know Christ? Why would they need to know Christ? So, beloved, we don't want to be genuine imitations, right? We just want to be genuine. That's what we want to be. Let me tell you this. Genuine imitations, at the end of the day, only fool one person themselves. Genuine imitations. God's looking for genuine. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the reminder. I think, uh, Lord, probably not one of us could look at our life today and not itemize or think of somewhere where one of these categories perhaps fits more than it should, more than we'd like it to, and certainly more than you would like it to. So, Lord, would you help us to come before you with a repentant heart, Father, even if this is a besetting sin that plagues us again and again, help us to get up every time, truly confess it to you, and move on until the day when you take it away for good. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us. And I pray that you will build within us great desire to live a Christ-like life for the glory of our great God and Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.